Last week, I covered five bad habits that I picked up in medical school and residency. Today, let's cover five good habits that you'll hopefully pick up in your path to becoming a doctor. What's going on, guys? For those of you who are new here, my name is Kevin Jabal, former plastic surgery resident and currently a serial entrepreneur in the med ed and med tech space. Now, the first good habit I learned is becoming statistically literate and not being easily swayed by what the media is portraying in their new summary of this hot new research. So in college, as a pre-med, in medical school, and in residency, you're gonna become more and more familiar with research, with the primary literature, meaning the actual scientific studies that get published in these scientific journals. And I've talked about this quite a bit on the Med School Insiders channel. There's a lot that goes into a good research study. There's study design. Is it retrospective? Is it prospective? Is it cohort? Is it a randomized controlled trial? Is it blinded? There's all these things that then each of these study designs has strengths and weaknesses. And by understanding how a study is formulated, how they're gathering data, their various techniques, even the statistical analyses methods that they're using, you can better understand what a study is demonstrating and what it cannot demonstrate. Or as the media would say, what it can prove and not prove. And what I found pretty consistently is that the media summaries are usually very, very, very watered down. And if you actually want to know the, the nuance of what this study is saying, you have to read the primary literature yourself. And at the beginning, I remember when I was in college and I first started reading primary literature for my neuroscience major, it was challenging. And I've gone over again on the Med School Insiders channel how to approach research, how to make it more approachable. And now, I mean, I've published dozens of papers myself. I've read thousands of studies and it's a lot easier to approach a scientific paper and figure out a lot faster what is it trying to say, what is it not actually saying, and what, what value can I derive from this piece of scientific literature. Habit number two is paying much closer attention to health. And most med students go through at least a, a small hypochondriac stage in med school where you're learning all these different ailments, and then you think you probably have one or the other, but after you get past that, you have a much more comprehensive and robust understanding of human health. And that applies to obviously both myself and my own health and exercise and the various metrics that I like to monitor. There's a lot of these preventable health conditions that when you're younger, you may not think, oh, you know, I'm not gonna get diabetes. Like I'm able to eat anything and not get fat. And then you learn how different ethnic groups store fat differently and have different metabolic issues. And I've been a lot more on my mom's case about her exercise and diet because you learn how much of our medical issues in westernized society is preventable. You know, my mom is Punjabi and North Indians, if you look at BMI, right, they actually adjust BMI based on ethnicity because you're trying to stratify your risk for various diseases. And a lot of North Indians, like my mom, we store visceral body fat Subcutaneous is what's right underneath your skin and then visceral is your, your fat around your internal organs. And visceral body fat is what's tied to, you know, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, things like that. So even at a lower body weight and a lower BMI, right, then you have a higher risk of having these metabolic issues. So for certain Asian ethnicities, they actually shift the scale. So rather than 25 to 30 being overweight, maybe it's like 23 to 27, I'm forgetting the exact numbers. But as you go through med school and residency, you're gonna interact with hundreds, thousands of patients, and you'll see a wide range of, of ages and health statuses and different conditions. And you'll see how, you know, if you live a certain kind of way, over time, those effects compound. And if you are unhealthy at 25, you're probably gonna be unhealthy at 30 and 35. And those habits are gonna result in a very different lifestyle and outcome than if you were healthier and eating better and exercising more frequently and sleeping better. Number three was learning how to optimize learning and efficiency. And these skills obviously are most helpful when you're studying for your med school exams, your boards, but it also expands to other domains in life. For example, I now understand the importance of active learning with spaced repetition after a lot of experimentation and research in med school. And now I can apply that to other domains in my life when I want to have targeted focused learning. And knowing that you should do active learning with spaced repetition is one thing, but when you actually put in the reps, the hours, the days, the years of of doing that study strategy, you understand how it feels. You understand the roadblocks you'll face and how to overcome them and navigate that. So as a result, I'm not just grateful for knowing what it is and how to do it, but I'm so familiar with the process that now it's almost like second nature. And at the beginning, it definitely wasn't because again, active learning is much more challenging and difficult than passively reading your notes. And tying in with this is the idea of efficiency across all domains of my life. So when you're studying, when you're trying to optimize your studying, you want to get the most amount of work done, learn the 
most amount of information in the smallest amount of time. And part of that is knowing when to study during the day. So for most people, myself included, studying in the mornings is gonna be more fruitful than studying when I have my afternoon slump or really late at night. By applying myself and studying hard and working hard when I feel sharpest, I can actually spend fewer hours and get the same amount of work done and then use that downtime to recharge with exercise, with chores, with other habits. And I've done several videos on these efficiency tactics, like using your downtime intelligently or using Pomodoro and then switching from maybe Anki cards to then reading new content so that you can marathon over hours rather than getting burned out and bored. Number four is growing self-confidence from overcoming obstacles and challenges. Everyone is gonna face obstacles in pre-med, med school, and residency. And for a lot of us, it's the big challenging tests like step one, or we're just learning how to study and, and handle so much information in such a short period of time. And for others, it's, you know, adjusting to clinical rotations with surgery being a really challenging one, for example. And for others, it's, it's their own health issues or the death of a loved one, stuff like that. But regardless, I never think that faking it until you make it is a good way to build your self-confidence and build your, your self-identity because that's a very slippery slope that results in imposter syndrome. Whereas if instead you take on small risks and then overcome them, or maybe you fail, but you realize it's not so bad, and with time you take slightly larger and larger risks and you take on more and more, then you'll build your confidence much more organically. The first time you do a history and physical with a patient, even a mock simulated patient, you're gonna be nervous and <laughs> it's, it's, it's somewhat challenging to you, right? Because this is completely new. And throughout med school, you're gonna have these standardized patient interactions and these OSCEs, meaning observed standardized clinical examination. The first time you do one, I remember our first one, it was like a, a, a GOSCI, it was a group OSCE. That was a couple weeks into the first year of med school. We were all so nervous, we're like, oh my God, we're gonna be recorded and evaluated. Oh, how do you do this? How do you do that? You're thinking about so many different variables and you're, and you're not like, comfortable or at ease, most of us were pretty stressed. And then at the end of med school, you have to do one to like, to graduate to, you know, pass your requirements. And then you do one and you're like, this is so easy, I could do this with my eyes closed. Why was I stressed about this at all in the first place? It's such a cool thing to see that where you started and then how far you've come. And number five is honing my discipline and work ethic. I like to think of med school as being this pressure cooker in some way where if you mix the right ingredients, then it can really rapidly accelerate your own growth and transformation. And you can actually enjoy the process a lot more. And then those skills that you develop will also translate to other domains of your life. And the work ethic and discipline that I had honed in, in med school then gave me the confidence that I can probably apply this to other domains. Like I have some entrepreneurial interests. Why don't I just apply that here and see what happens? And then I went on at the end of med school to start a biomedical incubator at my med school called Blue Link. And then I started a YouTube channel and then I built a business around that YouTube channel on our website. And now I'm working on MEM, which is a MCAT study tool that is a completely different business model. I believe that your mindset in a lot of ways is more important than your skill set because the mindset results and leads to the skill set. So if I have the mindset that I can grow, that I can improve, then I'm gonna improve my study strategies. I'm gonna improve my public speaking skills. I'm gonna improve my discipline, my work ethic. And then that will result in the skills that are needed to build the businesses. A lot of people don't have that confidence in themselves. And they say, hey, I can't do this. I don't have my MBA. And they, they make all these excuses that then hold them back. Whereas if you just believe in yourself and you believe, hey, I can learn this. I will learn along the way. I will make mistakes. Then you'll maybe even surprise yourself with what you're able to accomplish. All right, now it's your turn. Let me know what good or bad habits you have learned from med school and residency. And if you haven't already, check out my video on five bad habits I learned or my video on stealing my productivity tactics. Much love and I'll see you guys there.